We're so glad that you're joining us for Lesson 10. We are talking today about husbands and wives together at the cross, the unity of the family. It's a beautiful study. I'm Shelley Quinn. Let me introduce the rest of your 3AB and family here. Professor Daniel Perry. Yes, I have Monday's lesson. Glad to be here. And it is the church as the bride of Christ, part one. Part one. Who's got part two, James well, Rafferty? Guess what, Shelley Quinn? My name is James Rafferty, and I have the bride of Christ, part two. <laughs> oh, well, we are so glad, Pastor, wow. you're joining us. And Pastor John Lomagain. I have love your wife as you do yourself. I'm going to enjoy this topic. I. That's why I assigned <laughs> it to you. <laughs> and yes. Pastor John Dinsey. Thank you. I have Thursday the one flesh model of marriage. Amen. Well, I'm just so excited to jump into this. Daniel, could you have our prayer, please? Love to. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we dedicate our lives to you once again, as well as this time and our understanding from the Word of God. May it be filled with the Holy Spirit and each heart, each mind, each soul, each body, each person that is studying along with us. Lead them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Today we are talking about husbands and wives together at the cross. What a beautiful picture of unity. Let me give you a imi an image to put in your mind. If you think of a triangle, when husbands and wives are joined, they're here at the bottom part, they become one. A husband shall leave his mother and father, cleave to his wife, they'll be one flesh. Let's put Jesus at the apex. What happens as husbands and wives walk their journey together? The closer they get to Jesus, what's happening? The closer they get to each other. Paul begins in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 saying, husbands love your wives. Now he's going to give us the pattern for that love. This is the love husbands are to pattern. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her for the purpose that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word for the purpose that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing for the purpose that she would be holy and without blemish, spotless. That's Christ's love for us. He wants to encourage us. He wants to develop us. That's the same way a husband is to love his wife. We saw last week in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Paul says, be imitators of Christ. Walk as children of the light. Walk in the love of Christ, giving of yourself just as he gave himself for us. Ephesians 5.21, he says, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord, out of respect for the Lord. See, this includes everyone. Mm -hmm. We are all to be submissive. Every Christian who has the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God is love. He's the spirit of love. God is humble. The eternal light of his humility is seen when God came down and took on flesh to die for us. So we should be walking in a non-competing humility. God, the Father, Son, and Spirit don't compete with each other for authority or position. And when Jesus was here on earth, when God came down to become the person of Jesus. The second person of the Godhead voluntarily walked in submission of the Father's will. He brought glory to God. The Holy Spirit voluntarily walks in such a way that he brings glory to Jesus. So it is so beautiful because there is total submission among them and no Christian is superior to another. In Galatians 3.28, Paul said, hey, there's neither Jew nor Greek, mm -hmm. neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. Mm -hmm. All are one in Christ. So I think it behooves us to remember that and walk in submission to one another. Here's the bottom line. 
What is the smallest unit of the church? The family is the smallest unit of the church. It's the cells that build up the body and the muscles of the church. And where is the devil attacking the most? Mm -hmm. He knows if he can destroy families, mm -hmm. he can destroy the church. We are new creations in Christ. Right. We have new power mm -hmm. available to us to help us to be imitators of Christ, to reflect his love and his light, to fulfill God's plan of bringing everything together unified in Christ Jesus, which takes us to counsel to Christian wives. This is Sunday's lesson. Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. I'm going to read from the Amplified. Wives, be subject to your husbands. Be submissive. Adapt yourselves as a service to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. Now, some women just go, ah, I don't like that. Nope, don't want any part of that. Mm. Think about this for a second. What is a body with two heads? It's unnatural. It's dysfunctional. So the husband has been appointed as the head of the family unit. Now, let me be sure I explain this. Only Christ is the head of the church, right? Christ doesn't force his will upon us. He, he doesn't force us to go in a certain way. He leads us by his example of love. He encourages us to work. He, he's always working for our eternal benefit. So being a submissive wife doesn't mean that you are giving up your free will. You know, and I think that's what some people think is, oh, I've got to walk in submission and be free. No, it doesn't mean you're going to be controlled by your husband. It means you are voluntarily for the glory of God, allowing your husband to take that position of authority. And I have to say, it is so easy for me to be submissive to my husband, J.D. J.D. always wants what's best for me. He encourages me to do my best. He, we always talk about things from all different directions. He, we consider each other's input. We weigh things. And when we get to an impasse, I easily acquiesce to him and say, honey, you're the head of the house if this is what you think. But it's because I'm not being controlled. He's protecting me. And I do want to point out one thing. It, we're going to see this in the lesson. Submission is only warranted to a husband who is loving and supportive. Ephesians 5.25 this is the counsel to husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Christ gave his all in self-sacrificing love for the church. And the husband is to follow his example. His authority as head is also his responsibility before God to love his wife and want what's best for her. It is not to exercise total control, but I want to tell you something, husband. It is also not to support her in sin. If you have a wife who has the sin of idolatry and say it's excessive spending, you aren't because you are loving her with self-sacrificing love supposed to support her in that. We've got to be practical here. Uh, Any time in holy matrimony, that we find sin, it's an abuse of the relationship. Paul said in Colossians 3.19, husbands, love your wives. Do not be bitter toward them. So communication is the relationship. You need to learn to communicate with one another. Now the call to the wife to be submissive. I want to read from the adult Bible study guide. Dr. McVeigh says, the passage presumes a loving, caring marriage, not a dysfunctional one. This verse should not be interpreted to allow any form of domestic abuse. Submission 
does not include the extraordinary circumstance of abuse. Abuse is sin. God's counsel to us is to, would be to separate from abuse. Abuse is selfish, it's disrespectful, it's harmful, and it's damaging to the relationship with God. So I want to say this, if you are, abuse is both genders, all economic situations. If you find yourself in a toxic, abusive situation, you've got to recognize it and stop it by withdrawing yourself, separating, I'm not saying divorce, but separating yourself from those circumstances. Let me tell you why. My sister was abused by her first husband, hospitalized five times. Mm. Her, the counsel to her was, you just need to learn to be a better wife, love him more, be more patient, do this, pray more. No, I believe that God can do miracles, but an abusive, toxic person is not responding to the Spirit of the Lord. It's not your fault if you're being abused. Mm -hmm. It is a sin, and for the protection of yourself and your children, you should separate to hopefully give your partner the opportunity, the wake-up call, mm -hmm. to come to the feet of Jesus, to repent that you can be reconciled. It isn't easy, but it's necessary. And I want, if you're going to stop the unending cycle of abuse, let me give you some spiritual counsel that I gave to my sister. Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5, Paul says, Know this, in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of self, having a form of godliness but denying its power from such people turn away. Second Thessalonians 3, 6 says to withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. Proverbs 14, 7 says, Go away from the presence of a foolish man when you perceive in him. Do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. Here's the point. God loves you too much to have you abused. He's not saying be submissive to an abusive husband. But husbands, you are to love your wives. Wives, you are to respect your husbands and you are to recognize their authority just over the family unit as we recognize the authority of Christ over his body. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. And I, I pick up right there where you leave off with the church mm -hmm. as the bride of Christ, part one. And Paul here is blending two topics together, which indicates to us that through the church, we learn about marriage and through marriage, we learn about the church and Christ. God does not leave us without an example to follow, thankfully. In marriage, that example is what Christ did for the church. Verse, 25, verse five, 25 of chapter 5 in Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives just as, exactly like Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. The love of Christ for the church was willing, glad, joyful, eager, enthusiastic, complete self-sacrifice, and that then is the example given to husbands. Look at what Jesus did. Imitate that toward your wife. And then just as uh, Christ, the church's submission to Christ then, willing, joyfully, gladly, eagerly, mm -hmm. becomes the example of wives towards husbands. Uh, the complete self-sacrifice of the husband for his wife makes her submission worth it. Because why wouldn't you want to absolutely trust somebody who would never leave yeah. you astray, who would sacrifice their own comfort, their own privilege, their own rights, their own advantage, so that they could preserve your comfort, privilege, rights, and advantage in a godly way. 
And, and why wouldn't you, as a husband, gladly do that? The submission and respect of a wife makes your self-sacrifice completely worth it. It's more than enough, more than abundant return. And the only way, this only works as God designs when both people fulfill God's designed role, which is in submitting first to Christ in everything. Because marriage is more than just a, a human relationship. It is a symbol. It is a teaching tool. And, and of a it is a symbol of our relationship with Christ. And by entering into marriage, we as Christians, we agree to illustrate something about God. And this is why we do need to put that decision to marry before God and say, Lord, I know that you want to be seated in the midst of every relationship so that it expresses what you're like, particularly in marriage. And for those of you who are considering marriage, kneel down and pray and say, Lord, lead me to who you would have me be united with so that it illustrates you, so that we are more effective for you together than we would have been apart. We would never think of taking God's name in vain, but uh, when we enter marriage without his instruction, we risk presenting an illustration of God's name and character that is not what he would have chosen. In marriage, we are acting out a part of the plan of salvation, and that part is the church's relationship to Christ. Every relationship of ours exemplifies what God wants. And so we don't compartmentalize our relationships and say, ah, oh, this is mine. No, they all belong to Christ and illustrate him. Every truth about Christ should be seen in our marriages. That's right. It's a teaching tool. And so we ask, God, what do you want me to learn through my marriage? What do you want me to illustrate and demonstrate through my marriage? This is one reason why marriage is holy like a priest who administers sacred and holy things, so also is marriage. Every marriage is a mini sermon. I guess not a mini sermon, it's a lengthy sermon. It is a long-term visual aid about what the relationship with Jesus is like. Christ gives up everything to lift up the church and the church willingly and gladly then submits to the leading of Christ, all in love and selfless love. And so every time you see your spouse, you say, Lord, what are you teaching me? What are you wanting to show me about a relationship with you? And so verse 32, Paul says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And remember, a mystery is what God alone can reveal and what he reveals over time. And we definitely see that in marriage because through time we see God working and illustrating and strengthening in marriages. How does the Bible set marriage as a symbol of the church? We see a couple places in the Old Testament. Hebrews, sorry, Hosea, Old Testament, chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, says, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and justice and loving kindness and mercy. Aren't those all words that we want to have God illustrate in us? I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Betrothed is a, a committed promise to each other. And look at who does the betrothing? God all the way. As I hear Shelley repeat uh, over and over again, righteousness by faith, God doing the work in us, through us, while we participate with him. Isaiah 54 verse 5 says, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Ezekiel 16 is another one of those places where we see a long-term illustration, a, a, a visual aid of a relationship. And I'm not going to read the entire chapter, but I want to cut touch just a few verses here. And this chapter is referenced in the adult Sabbath school study lesson. Uh, chapter 8, sorry, chapter 16, verse 8, the end of the verse says, Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord. Song of Songs, chapter 6, verse 3, gives an illustration of that. And we see that describing marriage. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. A, a, a mutual dedication and giving of ourselves to each other. And it's not ownership, like I, you own me, I own you, but I willingly give. All right, verse 9 there in Ezekiel 16 talks about being washed 
all right? And then verse 10 talks about being clothed. And verse 11 talks about being adorned. And we find all those subjects addressed here in chapter five of Ephesians. Listen to Matthew, Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6. And I know this is addressed a little bit later. But Jesus, quoting here Genesis 2, verse 24, says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God joined together, let no man separate. Notice who's the main character here. It's not the husband and it's not the wife. It is God. God joins them together. God does it. We may say things like, I chose a spouse or I got married, but God is the one who is to do it. He is the one who is to be lifted up in marriage. Any blessing that comes through marriage, it's not because we're such great husbands or wives. We're not, but because God is. And so it is with the church. God's the main character. And that goes without saying, but there are so many ways that we deal with church business in a Christless way. We can put a lot of things before God in the church and begin bearing burdens that he hasn't placed upon us, being loveless in both church and marriage. There's two ways that God is to be the main character in marriage in the church. And one of them is that he pays the bride price. It says he gave himself. We don't like the idea of paying a bride price. But honestly, if you had to pay what your spouse was worth, you would never afford it. Um, the custom was known then, and it simply conveys to us that the, the bride is of a high value. And of course, our world tries to t twist that reality. Proverbs 31 verse 10 says it, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. And whoever finds a wife finds a good thing, Proverbs 28, 22. And what's the price? Jesus pays himself, purchased by his blood. But then the other thing that Jesus does is he prepares his bride. We think of a bride as readying herself, dressing in a white gown, arranging her hair. But with God, there's no surprise when he meets us. He is involved with every step of the way. Verse 26 says he washes her with water, with the word. That's an intimate picture there. But washing means taking things away that don't belong. God wants to do that to his church teachings that don't belong there, ideas that have been left over that, uh, from, from misunderstandings. God says, I want to wash those things away. And then it says that he wants to adorn or dress her and present her a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or blemish or any such thing that God then adds truth, adds a correct understanding of his word so that we are based on the word of God. No spot. That would be a teaching that doesn't belong there. Something that is not right. No wrinkle. Think about a garment that you wear for a long time and it's become stretched out. Sometimes there's teachings and traditions that have hung around for a long time mm -hmm. and then no blemish. Nothing is wrongly formed. Nothing is out of place. God puts in order each of the things we are to understand and believe as a church. And as I end here, Ellen White says this in Last Day Events, page 52, the church enfeebled and defective, needing to be reproved, warned and counseled is the only object upon earth upon which Christ bestows his supreme regard. Christ loves his church. Very Amen. beautiful teaching. Thank you, Daniel. We are going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. And now we continue with Tuesday's lesson, James Rafferty. Tuesday's lesson is the, ch the Church, the Bride of Christ, Part 
2. So we're going to pick up right where Daniel left off. And of course, Daniel picked up right where Shelley left off. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. How does Paul use elements of the ancient wedding in appealing to Christians in Corinth? The quarterly asks that question and gives us these verses. So let's take a look at these verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Paul says, Would to God that you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So Paul begins with this idea of godly jealousy. And I think this is so appropriate in relationship to what we've been talking about so far, because there are a lot of people, uh, husbands specifically, who are abusive because they say they are jealous over their wives. But Paul's talking about a different type of jealousy. Yes, amen. He's talking about a godly jealousy. And godly jealousy is defined, you know, God tells us right in the context of his commandments, which is a revelation of his character, he tells us that I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. That's right. Right? So what does that mean? Well, godly jealousy is jealous because of how things are going to affect you. Yes. Selfish jealousy is jealous because of how things affect me. I don't want you doing that because of how it affects me. Godly jealousy is completely other-centered. That's right. In other words, Paul here is jealous for the church in Corinth because he's afraid they're going to be deceived. He's worried about them. He's not thinking, hey, I baptized all of you and uh, my reputation's at stake here. If you guys go with another gospel, another church, what are people going to think about me? You know, they're not going to think I'm a good evangelist. They're going to think there's something wrong with me. You know, Uh, uh, get it together because people are going to miss, you know. No, he's thinking about them. He's thinking, if you are deceived, thinking that uh, this, this other gospel, this other Jesus, this other spirit is in harmony with what I've taught you, you're going to be lost. And I don't want you to be lost. I want you to be saved. I want to present you as a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ. Godly jealousy is considering the other person, not spirit. yourself. That's and right. this is where Paul is coming from. Now, the only way Paul can have this godly jealousy is in the context of what he's written here in Ephesians chapter 5. So we're going to go back to Ephesians chapter 5 and just look at verses 25 through 27 again. Husbands, love your wives. Oh, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You know, a lot of times, and you brought this out, Shelley, a lot of times, you know, we kind of recoil as, uh, I say we, but, you know, females recoil, my wife recoils from the idea of submit to your husbands. But, but really, I tell people, really, this is where the rubber meets the road. Oh, absolutely. For a husband to love his wife as Christ loved the church, that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of the water of blood. If that happens, if you see a husband that loves his wife as Christ loved the church, and you have a godly woman who's a Christian who's surrendered to Christ, guess what's going to happen? She's going to surrender to her husband. Right. It's just going to be an automatic. There's not going to be any difference there. But then he goes on to say this. He says that he might present it to him a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish before him. So the, the question that's asked in the, in the context of this lesson is, when does the presentation of the bride of Christ occur. Now, this is uh, an analogy that's being used here. The, the relationship, the, the marriage between a husband and a wife is an analogy. It's, a, it's illustrating the relationship between Christ and his church. When does the presentation take place? Well, the presentation takes place, according to these verses, when the church is without spot or wrinkle, when it's holy and without blemish, when it is cleansed by the washing of the water. So this presentation is the, is the um, goal of God's uh, will for the church. The ch- God wants the church to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You know, we use this uh, illustration uh, in the Bible of being washed. And I think about it in relationship to a washing machine. You know, when you have a washing machine, you have different cycles. So there's usually about four cycles. Mm-hmm. There's your colored cycle and there's your white cycle and there's your permanent press cycle and there's your heavy duty cycle. Mm-hmm. And it's the same in the Bible. You know, you see these cycles, like for example, there are four gospels. 
And these four cycles, these four gospels, you see these four prophetic cycles in the book of Daniel. You even see four prophetic cycles in the book of Revelation. And I like to tell people the first prophetic cycle in Revelation is like the white cycle because God is dealing with the churches and he's, he's, he's trying to get them clean. He's trying to get all the spots out of those churches, you know, and so you go through. And then the second cycle, the, the, the horses, that's like the color cycle because you got a white horse, and you got a black horse, and you got a red horse, and you got a pale horse. And then the next cycle, the, the trumpets, that's like a heavy duty cycle. I mean, that's heavy duty stuff. You're just <laughs> going. And then the final cycle, that's permanent press. That's when we get into the final message, you know, and we get into the plagues and the judgments and all the things that are taking place. Yeah. But what's the point? The point is, is that God is taking a people through these cycles, through this process of cleansing, you know, he's washing us because all the cycles are the same, basically. I mean, they're different, but they're the same. What you have is you have your wash and then you have your rinse and then you have your spin and then you have your rinse and then you have your spin. And that's going to be in the white cycle. It's going to be in the color cycle. It's going to be in the permanent press cycle. It's going to be in the heavy duty cycle. But there's a difference. Every gospel is a little bit different different. All of these prophetic cycles in Daniel and Revelation are a little bit different. You've got the image and you've got. So the point is this. We're all different in the body of Christ. And God is, is bringing us to a place where that, as you said, Shelley, that triangle, those two people come together closer to Christ and come closer to each other. Amen. So that the threefold Amen. cord is not easily broken. Ooh, that's what I was so how does the bride get us ready? How do we get ready for this? Well, look in Revelation chapter 14. And let's just look here at verses one through five. We've looked in Ephesians, of course, that's the basis. We've looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, of course, that uh, again uses this language. And, and now we're going to Revelation chapter 14 to answer the question, how does God get us ready as a bride, as a people? And I looked, John says, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. That's the finished product right there. They're on Mount Zion. They have the father's name written in their foreheads. They're sealed. They're, they're there. How did they get there? And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song, verse 3, before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women. So Paul's uh, prayer, Paul's purpose, Paul's jealousy is being answered. They're not defiled women. They're virgins, just like what Paul wanted, what he prayed. I, I want you to be chaste virgins. These are they which are not defiled with women. How did they get to that place? How did they get rid of all the spots and all the blemishes? These are they which follow the Lamb. Amen. But it doesn't stop there. See, a lot of people say, oh, I follow Jesus. I follow the Lamb. Yes, I I'm a believer. I just, I love Jesus. I, 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 lo I go to church. No, these are they which follow the Lamb. What's the last three words there? Wherever he goes. Wherever he goes. A lot of people follow the Lamb, but they don't follow him wherever he goes. Mm -hmm. You know, they, when God says, well, you know what? The seventh day is the Sabbath. They don't follow him there. When God says, you know, you really tithe this really something that support my work. Or, they don't follow him there. You know, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You really ought to think about what you, they don't follow him there. They're, they're willing to follow when it comes to, I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. God's forgiven my sins and that's the end of that. But when it comes to following him wherever he goes, God is developing a bride down through time. Old Testament, as Daniel shared, into the New Testament. Yeah. God is developing a bride, not a bride that he's abusing in any way, shape or form. This is a free choice that we make. God is developing a bride that will so fall in love with Jesus that they'll just want to be with him wherever he goes. I think of the author of the book of Revelation. That's the attitude he had. He just wanted to lean on Jesus' breast. He just wanted to be wherever Jesus was. That's where he wanted to be. Right. That's the kind of love God is developing in our hearts. As you said earlier, we can't do that. We can't do that. That's the new covenant. That's the everlasting covenant work of God to do that. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They're redeemed from among men. They're the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. In their mouth is no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. One last scripture, Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad. Revelation 19, verse 7, and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and it was granted that she should be arrayed with a fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Amen. Here we have Paul's uh, Ephesians epistle answered. And notice what it says here. It says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. It's not talking about giving honor to the church. It's not talking about giving honor to, to, to the people. It's talking about giving honor to him. Why? Because the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. How did that happen? Give honor to him. 
She was granted, verse 8, that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, and the righteousness of saints comes from the Lord, our righteousness. Amen. 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 Thank you, James. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Shelley. Mine, I'm, I'm going to enjoy this lesson. It's called Love Your Wife As You Do Yourself. And I love my wife more than I love myself. <laughs> Ephesians 5, verse 28 to 30. So husbands, in light of the fact that he presents himself to his wife that he submits and he wants to purify her in light of that. So husbands are to love their own wives as their own bodies. I love the way this passage ends in Ephesians 5, 28. He who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. My wife uh, celebrated a birthday not too long ago, and we were, people were giving tributes to her in the room, and we, we went to Jamaica and celebrated together a lot. I, I think about 24, no, about 40 of us went, and they're passing the microphone around, and when the microphone got to me, they said, what could you say to you about your wife? I immediately teared up. Because I think, you know, being married as long as we have and doing as much as we've done together and having so much that we've endured together and uh, growing together, met when we were 16 years old. And um, when we look at that, when, we, when I look at all of that and all we've become, uh, I, I was so full. Mm -hmm. I wasn't uh, shedding a tear out of sorrow or anything, but I was just so full. It's like, where do I begin to express how much I love this woman? And I think about God's love for us because as a people, you know, the church has not always been what it ought to be. But as in the book of Hosea, mm. you know, when she was turning away from her husband, when, uh, when Gomer was turning away from Hosea, um, the Lord said, I will pursue her. I will go after mm. her. Uh, and then when she pursued everything, when the when she pursued everything that she thought would bring her joy and it didn't, she said, I will go back to my husband for it was better with me then than it is with me now. And I think of how much Christ gives for the joy of his church. So Paul brings out these beautiful principles and I love the fact that Dr. Uh, John McVeigh brought them out so wonderfully. So I'm gonna bring them out in um, nine different points and hopefully I'll have a chance to end with the quotation that I chose from the book Ministry of Healings. But, um, the question asked in the lesson, what new argument does Paul use to encourage husbands to practice tender love toward their wives, opposite than what you talked about, abuse? Mm. The opposite of that is practicing tender love. And thank you for that illustration, of prophetic illustration mm. of the connection to Christ and his church. Love it. And, uh, and, and Daniel, you know, you were just right on point all the way through. Thank you for your, uh, your professorship and approach to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. But I love these principles brought out in the Word. We find here submission to one another, Ephesians 5, verse 21 to 23. You, you all talked about that, so I'm not going to repeat the passages. Mm -hmm. But submission does not require the surrender of individuality, Amen. but the recognition that we are stronger together. Mm -hmm. That's the beautiful thing about it. There's, there are times my wife and I are on completely different pages, mm -hmm. but we, we stop and say, okay, let's look at this. Which one is better? Okay, great. let's go with it. And, and I'm not a person that's sold on the fact that I have the best ideas all the time, and neither is she. So we submit to one another in the fear of the Lord, recognizing that, hey, and this is something I tell all the couples I counsel, you win together or you lose together. Mm -hmm. No husband wins an argument and the wife loses or the other way around. You win together, you lose together. When a basketball team starts to argue amongst themselves, they are going to lose the game. Mm -hmm. Never think that you are going to argue to win an argument against your spouse. You both lose or you both win. Mm -hmm. So you need to build on principles that strengthen your marriage. Be willing to understand each other's point of view on topics that you don't agree on. Vitally important. Mm -hmm. And agreeableness is far more important than just agreeing. It's the fact that the spirit behind it is more important spirit. than the very thing itself. Mm -hmm. So here's the first thing. Avoid situations that threaten spousal unity. Matthew 19, verse 6. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. When you recognize you are one, allow nothing or anyone to threaten that unity. 
Even your choices don't allow your choices to threaten the unity that is only found in the holy confines of marriage. Secondly, when peace is the focus, the marriage will be blessed. Ephesians 4, verse, 20, verse 2 and 3, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. When peace is the focus, the marriage will be blessed. The third thing, nurture the highest principles of marriage. What is that highest principle? 1 Corinthians 13, 13, now abides faith, hope and love, these three, but the greatest of these is? Love. Is love. Mm -hmm. Make love the highest motivation in your marriage. Fourth principle, implement virtues that will not become self-centered. Thank you for that. I love that when you talked about that. Jesus is not uh, self-centered and we should not either be that type of thing, that type of person, that type of characteristic. First Corinthians 13 verse four and five, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, mm -hmm. is not provoked, thinks no evil. Be careful, and I've said this to people, and I, this is true about us. When somebody comes and says something to you about your husband or your wife, Go check with them first to see whether or not that's true. A lot of times we say to our wife, what did you do? What did you do? Why would you do that? What are you talking about? You believe them over me? Mm. That, is, that has destroyed a lot of marriages. Mm. When people have easily accused a spouse, accused a spouse wow. and we took their word over the word of our spouse. Mm. Check it out. Come to them. Ask them, did this happen? And then, uh, then make the decisions accordingly. The other one is pursue love and faithfulness. Proverbs 3, verses 3 and 4. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. And so find favor in high esteem in the sight of God and man. Amen. Pursue that. Pursue that faithfulness. Let love and truth, let mercy and truth not forsake you. When you have truth in your marriage and you have mercy, Remember, something may be true, but if mercy is not included in that, even in God's law, the only thing higher than God's law is God's mercy. Mm -hmm. When you look at the most holy place, the Ten Commandments are inside the Ark of the Covenant mm -hmm. and the mercy seat is above that. Something may be true, but seek to implement mercy mm -hmm. when that person is broken. Mm -hmm. Number six, bind up and build up and encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11, therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. What you want your wife to do for you, you do for her. Mm -hmm. What you want your husband to do for you, you do for him. Don't seek to make it a one way. Somebody once says, you know, marriage is 50-50. And I tell them, if you think that's the truth, you don't know math and you don't know mm -hmm. women. You know, it's not 50-50 <laughs> or men. It's not 50-50 because some guys require more of their wives than God requires of us. Mm. Some women want more from their husbands than God wants from us. Mm. As one person went shopping and you heard the story, he says, uh, you know, she called him and said, this coat costs this much. And uh, he said, no, costs too much. And she heard, no, costs too much. Mm. <laughs> but he said, no, costs too much. Mm. And she came over with the coat. She said, honey, thank you. He said, no, I said, no cost too much. She said, but I heard you say no cost too much. Mm -hmm. Watch out when what your choices are and your decisions are cause your marriage to suffer somehow, either financially or spiritually. The other one, number seven, make love the motivating reason behind your actions. Don't do it because you think, what are you complaining about? I give you everything. It's not what you do, it's why you do it. The Bible says here, let all that you do be done with love. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Number eight, be kind and compassionate. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 4, 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's one of the hardest things sometimes that happens in marriage is when one or the other has some kind of transgression looming, forgiveness frees both of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Frees one from pain and hurt and anger and frees the other one from the constant barrage of guilt. Mm -hmm. That's why my point number nine is significant. 
be willing to forgive and restore each other. Mm -hmm. First Peter 4, 8, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Mm -hmm. So Paul was right. Those husbands that love their wives, love themselves. Christ is our example. I pray that you're that kind of husband and you're that kind of wife. Amen, amen. Thank you so much. What a tremendous lesson. Uh, but we're not finished. We have Thursday's portion and uh, my name is John Dinsey and the title is The One Flesh Model of Marriage. After hearing these things, I think it would be good to share some things that are considered record according to the Guinness World Book of Records. It says the shortest Hollywood marriage. The shortest Hollywood marriage on record was between screen legend Rudolph Valentino and actress Jean Acker. Valentino and Acker married in 1919. But barely was the service over before the bride began to regret to have uh, had second thoughts and decided to lock her new husband out of their honeymoon suite. <laughs> After knocking for 20 minutes, Valentine simply went home. In divorce proceedings, Jean Acker claimed they never consummated their union, which is not surprising given that her famed husband failed to get past the bedroom door. <laughs> the longest marriage was uh, on record goes to Herbert and Zelmira Fisher, who were married 86 years, mm -hmm. nine months, 16 days, as of February 27, 2011. Sadly, that is when Herbert passed away. Mm -hmm. He was 106 years old. Mm -hmm. The most married man in the world, Glenn Wolf, he was married 31 times. Oh, oh mercy. <laughs> the most married woman in the world, Linda Wolf, because her last name is Wolf, because she married Glenn Wolf last. She was married 23 times. Her first one was when she was 16, and the last one was a public uh, marriage because she married the most married man, uh, Glenn Wolf. Mm -hmm. So all these things, you say, well, wait a minute. Why so many divorces? Mm -hmm. Why so many unhappy marriages? If we would follow the biblical principles, we will have less trouble in this world. That's and right. we have heard godly counsel from God's Word from uh, Sister Shelley Quinn, uh, Daniel Perrin. Uh, we have uh, Pastor James Rafferty and Pastor John Lomacang. Uh, you know, when we go to God's Word, we understand that we should consult the Lord in every decision, yes. and marriage is one of them. Uh, some of the, uh, those listening may be not married, and perhaps their ears are kind of half, half, half on and half off because, well, I'm not married. That doesn't apply to me, but there's counsel here that will benefit you. Uh, for me, I understood that I better seek the Lord because I had seen some uh, friends and family uh, get into divorce situations, and I said, I gotta pray. I gotta ask the Lord for guidance. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And I think everyone here has gone to the Lord in prayer asking for the Lord to guide me, be, uh, guide them because we do not want to make a mistake. We need the wisdom of the Lord in making these decisions. And so the lesson takes us into what uh, happens uh, in the story of Genesis 2, 15 to 25 uh, about a husband and wife being one flesh. I'm going to quickly read here uh, from Genesis 2, 15. And it says here, beginning in verse 15, when the Lord God took the man, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man or woman should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not a found there was not found a helper comparable to him. Mm -hmm. The Lord wanted him to see that in nature and he would realize that he needed a helper. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Mm -hmm. 
And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So we have here the description of the Bible that God has given us as to a, the first marriage. God performed the first marriage. It is a divine origin. It's, the marriage is of divine origin, sanctified by the Word of God. Unfortunately, society has greatly distorted the marriage idea, and you can see uh, in the things that I, I mentioned from the Guinness work, Book of Records, some people want to, uh, they don't, they, they just go from one marriage to another, not considering that God's plan is for them to be one flesh together. And um, a lot of good advice has been given. I'm going to try to keep from sharing some <laughs> advice here, but I want to read to you from the lesson, Dr. McVeigh, Professor McVeigh, uh, uh, he says here, Note that in choosing Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, Paul selects a statement about marriage made before the fall and applies it to the relationship between Christian husbands and wives. In our distinctly post-fall world, rampant exploitation of the sexual relationship between a man and a woman reveals how deeply entrenched in modern cultures is the idea that the sexual union represents subjugation of the woman. Paul argues that the sexual relationship as reflected in Genesis is not one of subjugation, but of union. It does not symbolize or actualize the dominance of the male, but the union of husband and wife, so much so that they are one flesh. We may look to both Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 33 and Genesis 2, 24, then for an important countercultural and corrective theology of marriage and sexuality. So the book of Ephesians tells us these wonderful things that we have heard. Ephesians chapter 5 beginning in verse 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Okay. Now, this is an interesting thought that I'd like to leave with you. When, uh, wh where does Paul take us? He takes us to the beginning, before sin entered into the world. Marriage is holy. And before sin entered into the world, the plan is for one man to marry one woman, the two become one flesh. And Adam saw this and he realized she came from me. And so I, I encourage you to consider that when you go to the Lord in prayer and you ask him to guide you in choosing the one he wants you to marry, you should consider that this is the one the Lord gave you as the same way that Adam was given Eve. The Lord gave you this one. The Lord, this is the one for you. You are to become one flesh and remain faithful to, to one another, as you have already heard here, as in the Lord, in the Lord. And uh, in verse 33 of Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see she respects her husband. There should be mutual love for one another. The husband should treat the wife as he wants to be treated, as you heard from Pastor Lomakang. Matthew 7, 12 says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You want, you want your wife to treat you good? Treat her good. You want your husband to treat you good? Treat him good. And this is something interesting that I would like to share with you. Uh, what we learn in the first marriage that God performed with Adam and Eve is that a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and become one flesh. They are supposed to be inseparable, mm -hmm. remain together forever. This was the first marriage was supposed to last forever, but sin entered and caused an interruption. And since we're talking about this is a great mystery between Christ and the church, uh, we see that God created the woman out of the rib made taken from man. We see that Christ created the church, gave his life for it. The church is supposed to be one with Christ forever. Just as in the marriage, a man and a woman, their union should be forever. Christ gave himself for the church, created the church, 
And the idea of Christ's marriage to the church is that it should be a union that lasts forever. Mm -hmm. And we are to remain close to Christ. Mm -hmm. He is asking for us to be faithful to Him. He has shown faithfulness to us. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this is a mystery, it says, that He is speaking concerning the church. So husbands, love your wife and just as you love yourself, and as Pastor said, he loves his wife more than he loves himself. If we take it from the perspective of God's word, we will understand that as you hurt her, husbands, you are hurting yourself and you're hurting the testimony of God's word. Let's love one another. A ah, beautiful lesson. Thank you each and every one. We have just a couple of minutes for closing comments. Both marriage and the church are daily experiences that require daily prayer. The church is a type of marriage, uh, the relationship between God and His people, and we find that God is our husband and He's a jealous God, and we're going to see just how jealous He is when we get to the end of Revelation, when He protects His bride from the beast and when He uh, avenges His bride of those who've tried to harm her. So God wants us to be protective of our wives, but He also wants us to know that He's protective of us and He loves us and watches over us. Yes, very quickly, Ministry of Healing, page 360, paragraph 2. Though difficulties, perplexities, and discouragements may arise, let neither husband nor wife harbor the thought that their union is a mistake or a disappointment. Determined to be all that is possible to be to each other. Continue the early attentions. In every way, encourage each other in fighting the battles of life. Study to advance the happiness of each other. Let there be mutual love, mutual forbearance. Then marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be, as it were, the very beginning mm. of love. Amen. 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 And i like to close with something you heard before. You know, uh, the closer you come to Christ, the closer you will come to one another, as it was illustrated by Shelley Quinn. This is a wonderful thought, and you should consider it for your marriage. Well, I... You may at home be saying, there's something wrong with my marriage. Where do I begin? I want to pray Paul's words over you, that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. God pours his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, that you would be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ, that mm -hmm. you then can love your husband and love your wife as he wants you to become one. Join us next week, Lesson 11, Practicing Supreme Loyalty to Christ. Bye-bye.